I want to thank Brother Michael and his family for coordinating this evening, uh, for preparing and it, the team, that, the, the First Light team. First Light is the name of the television networks around Europe. First Light Germany, First Light Denmark, First Light uh, Italy, and so on. Uh, Romania, Hungary, and uh, other parts of the world have different names, but, Rome, but Europe wanted the, the name First Light. No, I didn't say First Light, I mean Light Channel. First Light is New Zealand, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> First light is because, first light because the, the, the day begins in New Zealand. As the sun comes over New Zealand, the date begins, they're near the date line. So I'm sorry, not first light, but, but light channel. And uh, I'm going to be in New Zealand speaking in January, and then in uh, Australia, but uh, it'll be for First Light Broadcasting Network. They wanted to have three angels like light beams crossing over the, the two, two islands of New Zealand. And... Uh, it started only about five years ago there, but it's broadcasting in every single city of New Zealand. And now they just started on satellite to reach the neighboring islands, and the Lord has really blessed. They started out with an initial capital, but it finished. And nobody knew what to do. Should we sign the contract again or not? We discussed it as a board, and we decided, let's just sign and see what God will do. And we signed the contract for a renewal of another three years. And... Uh, the, the viewers came on board and started helping out, and now they were even able to expand even more than last time. So God does miracles, but it, was, it made us tremble with fear to sign another contract when we had no idea how to pay for it. But we signed it, and it's going forward nicely and growing. God has a plan, and it is my desire that, that the weekend we spend together tonight, tomorrow, um, will be a blessing to you and encourage you to place yourself in God's hands and allow him to do whatever he wants to with you. It's, uh, uh, God has a beautiful plan for your life. And your dreams are nothing compared to God's dreams for you. So if you place your dreams in his hands, he will make you so happy and so grateful that you will, you will be thinking to yourself, why am I the lucky person? Why am I the most blessed person in the world? We think this all the time. My wife and I say, why are we the, the most blessed people on the earth? Because we feel like we're just so blessed to be doing what we do. And you will feel that way too. And some of you are already doing that. And I want to I thank you for that. But I hope it's an encouragement to you this weekend. Let us bow our heads as we begin. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you because we want to begin every session with a word of prayer. We want to ask you to speak to our hearts. We want to ask you, Lord, to, to convince us, to show us, to teach us, to prepare us, to carry out the greatest work that mankind has ever done to the control of the Holy Spirit. We ask for this, Lord, because in reality, we can't even imagine what has to be done and how to do it. But you invite us to be part of that great plan. You are on your white horse, going forth conquering and to conquer, and we want to be part of that great army that follows you across the heavens as, we pre as the world is prepared for your second coming. Thank you for hearing our prayer now. Surround us with your holy angels and your Holy Spirit. Fill us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our greatest need. What would you consider, if you were thinking of the greatest need that the church has today? Most of us would probably consider ourselves uh, to be waiting for Jesus' coming. Most of us would be consider ourselves to be part of God's people. But... As we look back and we say, what is the greatest need the church has? What would God, what is God's priority? Ma many of us would say, well, to finish the work, to tell the world. But I am convinced that God can finish his work very rapidly. If he had a people. If he had a people that would be totally surrendered and under God's control, he can finish the work rapidly. In fact, the delays and Jesus' return are not because he doesn't want to come. The delays are because he's waiting for us. What would, what would a bridegroom do coming without a bride to receive him? What if you came to your wedding and found no bride? If you're a man or if you're a woman, you, you wait for your bridegroom and he doesn't come. So God's greatest need is for his bride to be ready. 
Because if he's coming, his bride needs to be ready to receive him. He can finish the work very rapidly if he pours out his, his spirit on the people. Jesus had 12 disciples. And with 12 disciples, the known world was reached. I mean, just think of, of uh, disciple, uh, Thomas. Thomas went down to India. And the entire continent of India was pretty well reached by Thomas. Because he went everywhere, creating more disciples, teaching them. And for a thousand years, the Sabbath was kept and Christianity filled India. Many of the Christians today come from that time, from way back, from Thomas's time, from almost 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and uh, even though when Catholicism came into the country, and even though the persecution against, against Sabbath keepers and others was initiated, the Spanish Inquisition was brought to India, and many of those Christians did not survive the Spanish Inquisition and the Inquisition uh, of Sabbath keepers, uh, we still carry on many come directly from the time when Thomas evangelized India. The same can be said of all the disciples. They each went in different directions and they left a great work that God did through them. So how many, how many of God's children do you think God needs before he can finish the work? If he did it with 12, he can do it again. How about 144,000? If, if it's a literal or a symbolic number, we will know someday. But it's still a small group of people compared to the world population. How, mu how much? Do, how, what's our world population today? Between seven and eight billion, right? Somewhere in that number. It's it's bigger than what it was in Jesus' time. Do you think 144,000, be it literal or symbolic, do you think if they were filled with the Holy Spirit, could God finish the work? Absolutely. Are you determined to be one of them? Are you determined to be so controlled by God that he can finish his work? You see, the greatest need of the, work of the church today is to be controlled by God. But today we have many human controls in a church. <clears throat> we have influences from friends and family, influences from church members, influences from church leaders, and we're all being influenced by the world around us. We belong to the church. We are here with other church members. But many times we go to human authority to find out what we are to do. And God is waiting for a people that will come to Him to find out. That doesn't mean we shouldn't work together. We should work together. That doesn't mean that our leaders and our lay people should not work together. We should be one family working together. But it has to be, it is a requirement of God that it be under His control. You understand what I'm saying? How can God possibly finish the work when his own church is not under his control? And, and we're not talking about him controlling the church through a leader or leaders. We're talking about, that's one of the pillars of Protestantism, that God has access directly to each of our consciences. That's one of the pillars, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, and that every believer is a priest in that respect. Have direct access. Do you, do you have to go to a human priest to get access to God? Yes or no? No. Do you have access directly to God? Yes. That's called the priesthood of the believer. Where you don't have to go through a person to get to God. You can go directly to God yourself. And if you go directly to God yourself, He will give you directions. He will convict you of sin. He will prepare you. He will give you orders. That, uh, think of how many Levites used to work in the temple. How many prophets were, were worked in the temple? Mostly God had to find somebody else from outside under his direction to come and give the message. But the Levites were the employees of the church. But Jesus didn't, uh, God did not generally call Levites as, a, as priests. He had to call a person from outside of the employment in order to bring the message because his own employees many times were following human orders to the point where God had no control of them. So God had to find somebody else that would be willing to be his mouthpiece. So the question really is, does God, does God want to use his employees? Of course he does. But the employees have to understand, if you're a pastor, an elder, a treasurer, a department director, you work for the mission, the union, the division, or the general conference, your boss is not a human. 
your authority is God. The first thing you do is report to God in order to be controlled by God. And then you have a human person who is, your, who is the person in charge of you. But every, every pastor needs to understand that all the church members report directly to God. And all the pastors need to understand that they report to God before they report to man. And all of the presidents need to understand they report to God before they report to man. But if you don't know that, God has to look for somebody else. Does it make sense to you that God has to have total control of his people? Is that logical? If God doesn't have total control of his people, and I, I mean, if God asks you to do something, you don't have to go to a person and say, do I have your permission to do what God tells me to do? That doesn't work. You have to say, God has asked me to do that. Did you know that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to which uh, many of us belong, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, it, is, it is customary to get permission, if you're an employee, to do things. But when the church first started, it, it, the administration of the church would not tell the person where to work. They would go to the person and say, Pastor, where is God impressing you to work? Well, God is impressing me like J.N. Andrews, impressing me to go work in Europe. Okay? Then the church will send you to Europe because that is where God is asking you to go to work. You, you see the difference? We ask the person, what is God asking you to do? And we will support you in God's calling in your life. Today doesn't work that way. Today, we tell you where you're going to work and we'll tell you when you're going to work and how you're going to do it and when you're, where you're not going to work. But that's because we've drifted away from the understanding that God is to have total control of his church. It, if God's going to finish the work through us, he has to have total control of us. I hope you under, understand that clearly. Do you understanding, agree with that? For God to finish the work on earth, he has to be totally in control. <clears throat> now, the question then come back, comes back to us. Am I under the total control of God? That's the personal question that we have, to, we have to answer. If we say, no, well, before I can do what God tells me to do, I have to get permission from a human. Well, then we need to rethink the whole structure of our lives. Because God has to have ultimate control. Now, there is a group called 144,000. And again, I don't know if it's literal or symbolic. There is evidence on both sides. But that's not the most important point. The most important point is their, the characteristics, their character. It's a small group of people. They are first fruits. So it's not the whole harvest. The 144,000 don't represent the entire harvest. They are the first fruits. The first people to be sealed. The first people to be used by God to finish the work. The 144,000, I can tell you right now, they follow the Lamb everywhere the Lamb goes. Isn't that what Revelation 14 says? They follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. Does that represent what we're doing? Just, just ask yourself, is that what I do? Do I go wherever God asks me to go? Or do I say, my plans are this. Lord, bless my plans. You understand the difference? Or do we go to God and say, Lord, what are your plans for me? I want to work for you. I want to be part, I want to be part of God's, of the closing work on earth. And to be part of the closing work on earth, I need to ask God what he wants me to do. So this is something that, um, this is something that we all have to ask ourselves. And as we look at some of these things, I, I want to present to you now some words from Jesus, but I first wanted to underline the important principle uh, of having God be the final authority in our lives. The Bible being the final written authority and God being the final authority over our decisions through the Holy Spirit, through God's word and his guidance. I would like to ask you if you have your Bibles, if you don't, uh, I'll, I'll read it, but Matthew 25. There are, three, there are three parables in Matthew 25. Uh, all three parables are related. We're only going to deal with the first one tonight. Tomorrow we'll look, at, we'll look at some of the other principles found in the other two parables. But 
the principle we have in the first parable is about the ten virgins. Who are the ten virgins? Do they represent the whole world or do they rep do represent God's people? Well, let's read and find out. Verse, 20, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Right there, we know that it's a group of people that are waiting to meet the bridegroom. So it would represent the church. But there's something else. This is a special part uh, of, of God's church. It's the church that is looking forward to his coming. I would propose to you that probably they carry the name Adventist. <laughs> would you agree? That if you're going forth and waiting to meet Jesus in his second advent, you would be called Adventist. So, uh, so here you have here you have the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. These are, this represents God's remnant people that claim to wait for Jesus at his second advent. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So within the church, we have here described two groups. Foolish and wise. For the sake of illustration, God, Jesus shows five and five. They that were foolish took their lamps with them, but took no oil. But those that were wise took oil with them in their lamps. What does the oil symbolize in Scripture? The Holy Spirit. So there's a work of the Holy Spirit in preparation during the waiting time. Are we in the waiting time now? Jesus hasn't come yet. The final events have not erupted into the last final closing events yet. We can see them coming. We can see the storm on the horizon. We can see the preparation process, but we have not yet begun the last final rapid movement of closing scenes. We are right at the edge. So the door is still open for the Holy Spirit to prepare us. Now, let, let me back up and talk about, you know what happened on September 11, 2001. The whole world knows what happened, right? Two buildings went down, and the, the fall of those two buildings in North America, the Twin Trade Towers, well, actually, three buildings went down. Two, the Twin Trade Towers went down because they were, they, they, were, they were struck by the airplanes, but that's not why they went down. They went down because they were rigged with explosives. When I saw the, fir the first building come down, my wife and I said, that can't be done because of the airplane. That came straight down. That can only be done with explosives that dropped the top of the building if it would have fallen over like this, maybe. But the rest of the building wouldn't fall. And for it, they just come straight down. That's a demolition. And then, and then the next building came down in exactly the same way, another demolition. And then to make all things interesting, a seven-story building, the FBI building next door, also came down because of demolition. It wasn't even struck by an airplane. So any thinking person can tell you this was a setup. Office fires. <laughs> they said office fires. Well, a lot of buildings have office fires and uh, the cement still stands. But the building all came down. It was very clear to anybody who's a thinker that this was set up by demolition. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, recently uh, uh, under oath, an ex-CIA agent just recently, just recently, uh, under oath, stated that they were the ones that brought the buildings down. So the, it's finally being admitted that this was a setup by the U.S. In fact, the, the airplanes that struck the buildings, they weren't even passenger airplanes. So we, it became obvious to me, as a, uh, as a pilot, and looking at the evidence, just all you have to do is reason, and you know that this was something inside job. But the real terrorist activity wasn't that. The real terrorist activity was when we lost all our civil liberties and our rights in North America. Now that was an act of terrorism. And those people have never, never been punished. And, but that's what resulted. Well, Hitler learned that lesson too. He burned down the Reichstag and he, he accused his enemies and had them arrested. So it's an, old, it's an old trick. Attack yourself and blame your enemies. Nero. Nero burned down Rome and he accused the Christians. So this is, this is a common strategy. If you want to study warfare, all you have to do is attack yourself and blame your enemies. That's all you have to do. And, and so it wasn't anybody who knows anything can tell you. But on, on September 10, 
on September 10, I was, being, I was addressing 500 Adventist lawyers in Atlanta. The Southern Union asked me to do a presentation for the Adventist Legal Association. And I addressed them and I said, someday soon, there will be an event happen that will change all of history. We don't know when, but it'll be someday soon. And it will change the whole way that we do business in the world, definitely in North America. And I went home. And I arrived home with a little airplane, getting ready for my trip to South America. I loaded the airplane up on September 10, and we were waiting to leave on September 11. We had a good night's sleep, but I was woken up by a phone call. My brother said, turn on your television. And it, the building had just been struck. We watched as the second building was struck. Then we watched as the first building came down, and then we saw the second building come down. Well, immediately, of course, all planes that were in the air were asked to land at the nearest airport. And we heard that President Bush's airplane was flying from Washington all the way over to Arkansas, where, uh, where he had a hidden underground bunkers. And we looked up in the air, and usually you see fly planes flying everywhere. I, looked, I told my wife, I looked up, and I said, there was only one plane flying, and it was flying from Washington to, to, the same, to Arkansas. And I said, well, at least for the first time in my life, I know that that airplane is President Bush's on it. <laughs> it's the only plane flying in the whole United States. But think of this. On September 10, I stated something was about to happen, but I didn't know when. But it happened the next day. Now, as we look at the future, can we know that something is about to happen? C can any thinking person see that there's a storm on the horizon? Yes. The only people that cannot see it are people who are putting their head into the sand, th symbolically. An ostrich, we say, hides his head in the sand. I've never seen an ostrich hide his head in the sand, you understand. I've seen a lot of ostriches. But, but we say that as a symbolism. You hide your head in the sand so you can't see what is really happening. Well, God's people sometimes are the most blind people on earth. Because even though the whole world can see it, God's people don't want to see it. But, but any person who is honest, any person who is a thinking person, can see there's a storm on the horizon. The newspapers are talking about it. In fact, President, President Donald Trump just recently made a statement. They said, he said, uh, there is a storm coming that's about to erupt. Not using his exact words. And somebody asked him, what kind of storm is it? And he said, you're about to find out. Now, anybody who hears the news and reads the papers and watches the news can know that there's a storm coming. Just, just look at what's happening, the events on the earth. Something is about to happen. We all know that. We don't know the exact day. We don't know the exact event. But we can see the dark clouds on the horizon. Now, here we're talking about an event in Matthew 25. The bridegroom, it's the, the bride, the, the the virgins are waiting for the bridegroom. And verse 5 says, while the bridegroom tarried, they, how many slumbered and slept? They all slumbered and slept. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus is the bridegroom. And the virgins are the church. They claim to be pure. That's why they're virgins. They claim to be waiting for the bridegroom to come, Jesus coming. They all have lamps, which is to let their light shine. But part of the church forgot to do the preparation through the Holy Spirit. They still come to church. They still participate in activities of the church. Maybe some of them are elders. Maybe some of them are deaconesses. Maybe some are pastors. Maybe some are administrators. But they're in church, and these people are forgetting to make the preparation process so necessary to the Holy Spirit. What kind of preparation would that, could that be? A conviction of sin and putting away of sin? Uh, how about, how about uh, entertainment? Does it affect our entertainment? Or can I watch all the world's movies unaffected? 
Can I watch every movie the world makes and still be a highly spiritual person? No. Can you, can you read all the novels and all the filthy literature that exists and still be a spiritual person? Can you feed your body anything you want to and still be an Olympic athlete? No. Olympic athletes know very well that if they're going to compete, they have to have bodies that are prepared with a special diet and special exercise and special training in order to be able to be in the Olympics. The same way we're about ready to go to the spiritual Olympics. We're about ready to enter the last final competition. And so we need physical training and we need spiritual training. There's discipline that has to happen. Only the Holy Spirit knows how to do that. Now, according to this, let me ask you, does that preparation happen before the bridegroom appears or after the bridegroom appears? Before. Okay? When, supposedly, when they're sleeping. Well, how can I prepare when I'm sleeping? Well, unfortunately, that's the time you have. Because once they all wake up, it's too late to prepare. Let's keep reading, keep reading see what happens. Verse, verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Let us go forth to meet him. And then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the, the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil because our lamps are gone out. But the wise said, Not so, because then our lamps might not have enough. Go and find some for yourself. Go buy to them that sell. And while they left to buy oil, it says in verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. This is probably one of the saddest events ever to happen to the church. It's a wonderful event for those that had oil in their lamp. But it's such a sad event for all those virgins that waited so long only to find out that while they were gone, the marriage took place and the door was shut. Unfortunately, the, the church is about to find out too late that the preparation process, which it has to be done right now, has been postponed until some event happens which convinces them that the time has arrived. Now, it, it could be the Sunday law. It could be some other event that God has prepared. But whatever it is, the entire church wakes up. Would you say that today the church is generally sleeping? What, what does sleeping mean? It means we're occupied with the cares of this life, with business, with going to school, getting the children ready for school. Uh, it means we're occupied with all the things we have to do in life just to live, to survive. We have to go to our work. We have to do this. We have to do that. We, it's a non-ending. How many of you are usually busy people? Most of us. Raise our hands. We're usually busy people, which means our life is a never-ending circle of activities with a little bit of time to sleep. I, I'm one of those too. I confess that my life is, seems to be one round after the other. But if I get so occupied with my work, even doing religious work, even do, working for God. I can get so occupied, I forget to get oil in my lamp. I forget to give God the time He needs to prepare me. Now, I, I'm known for being a missionary. I have a reputation all around the world for working for God. But could it be that Uncle David is so busy that God doesn't have time to talk to him? Could it be that I don't have time to have proper worship and prayer? You know, somebody called me one time and said, I have a message for you from God. Well, when I hear that, I go, uh, maybe, maybe, yes, maybe, no. Let's see, what's the message? I had one one time that was not from God. You want me to tell you that one, the message? She said, I have a message for you from God. And I said, what is it? God wants you to know that you have so much power. God wants you to know that you, you, are, so, that you are so powerful that you can destroy your enemies in the name of God. All you have to say is the word like Elijah and they will burn up. And I go, not even Jesus did that. No, I'm sorry, sister. That message is not from God. And if I think I have power, then I can't work for God because I'm depending on myself, right? I'm looking to myself to be able to do the work. And that's fatal to a Christian, to depend on yourself. So I said, I'm sorry, that's not true. But the second time somebody said that, I was a little more on the alert. I went, uh, 
let me hear the message first and then I will know if it's from God. Well, let me tell you what the message is and you can tell me if you think it's from God. The message was this. I have a lot more to teach you. I need more time with you. What do you think? Is that from God or not? Would you all agree? That sounds like a message from God. God needs, slow down, David. I need more time with you because there's some things I still want to teach you. And I said, thank you, my brother. That message is of God. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, please help me to have more time with you because unfortunately we're working in 94 countries. We have over 100 projects. It's like giving birth. It's like having 20 children, right? A mother that has 20 children, is she pretty busy? Well, she gives the older children some responsibility, doesn't she? But at the same time, those mothers are very, very busy if you have a lot of children. Well, unfortunately, I gave birth to a lot of projects. God has helped me. I'm working everywhere, but I got phone calls and emails and communications. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm too busy. I need to slow down. And God, God impressed me that I'll take care of your projects. I need more time with you. Just be still and know that I am God. And that applies to all of us. It's not just a message for David Gates. It's a message for all of us. Be still. Slow down and spend more time with me because there's a preparation process. The Holy Spirit needs to cleanse me from self-dependence, from worldliness, from thoughts. He needs to purify, teach me things that need to be taken care of, sins in the past that need to be confessed. There's a lot of things that the Holy Spirit would like to do for us, but we have to stop and listen. So, so here we have a preparation process, the, the five the ten virgins wake up suddenly to an event. <clears throat> Very soon, the church is going to wake up. Those Seventh-day Adventists, I, I, I focus on Seventh-day Adventists because Adventists are a group of people that claim to be waiting for the Second Advent. Would that, would that be a correct statement? Is that why we chose the name? Okay. Of all people, we claim to be the people that is waiting for Jesus coming. Now, we used to believe officially, for 150 years, that Jesus' coming was imminent. What does imminent mean? At the door, right? It means any second now, someday soon, any day now. That's what imminent means. But the years have gone by, 150 years have gone by, and uh, the bridegroom is still not here, and while he tarried, we slumbered and slept. And in 2015, at the general conference session, I was there when the proposal was made to no longer use the word imminent in our basic fundamental beliefs. We, we no longer wanted to believe that Jesus' coming was imminent. He's waited too long. Who knows how long more he's going to wait? And several people stood at the mic and said, no, let's not change that. That is who we are. We are a people that believe and claim that Jesus is coming back soon. We can't change it. But the delegates raised their hand and said, we want to change it. And so it was changed. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, no longer officially believe in the imminent coming of Jesus Christ. We replaced it with the word soon. Well, people say, well, that means the same thing. Well, if it means the same thing, don't change it. It does not mean the same thing. Soon could be 10 years, 100 years, 200 years. Imminent means it's at the doors. So that was changed. There was one other thing that was changed, and that was regarding the spirit of prophecy, and I'll deal with that later, tomorrow. Um, we've made that. I'm just talking about the second coming right now. So Seventh-day Adventists have believed for 150 years that Jesus is coming back, and an, his coming is imminent at the doors. Well, while we tarried and wait, while the bridegroom... Well, by the way, does Jesus not really want to come to earth? Would you say that Jesus really doesn't want to come, or does he want to come? What, what do you believe? Does a bridegroom want to marry his bride? Why, the day before I thought, oh no, 24 more hours, I can't wait. Huh? I waited for 12 years to get married after I asked her to marry me. I asked her to marry me when I was 8 years old, and when I was 18, I, re, I, I got interested again. And by the time I was 19, I asked her to marry me. But I had to wait till I was 20, because that was the date that we set. 
and the day before, two days before, a week before, it seemed like it would never come, but finally the day came, and we got married. Jesus wants to get married too. He loves his bride. He wants to marry his bride, but his bride is not ready. Now, do you think Jesus wants to come and find an unready bride? No, of course not. In fact, he wouldn't be able to take his bride with him. What kind of marriage would that be? If you come and find your bride isn't even ready to be married yet. So he can't come. So Jesus' delay has nothing to do with his desire. It has to do with us. The delay is solely a function of the bride not being ready. Do you understand that? So if the bride is ready, the coming happens. So the Holy Spirit is moving on people's hearts today. Get ready, get ready, get ready. He's moving on our hearts tonight to get ready, to put aside the world. What, what if you found out that your bride had another lover? How encouraging would that be for you to get married? And you go to that, and Jesus says to his bride, do you want to get married yet? Oh, Lord, you know, I really love the world. The, Mr. World is here, and Mr. World is treating me pretty nice. And Mr. World is giving me nice things. And Mr. World is entertaining me. And Mr. World gives me gifts. And Mr. World gives me a pretty nice salary. And Mr. World gives me vacation. And Mr. World gives... And so we're telling Jesus, I love the world more than I love you. So Jesus cannot come until he has a bride that's ready. And once he has a bride... By the way, let me ask you a question. Is there a difference between the bride and the guests? How many of you have ever been a bride? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm just asking the women now this time. Okay, one man raised his hand, but he was thinking bridegroom. Okay, the, the brides. Okay, if, if you were the bride, and, uh, and after you got married, did you take all of your guests with you on your honeymoon? No, right? No. Who, who went on the honeymoon? The bride and the bridegroom, right? Just the two of you. Okay? When Jesus comes, he's going to have a bride and he's going to have guests. Because if you read Revelation 22, it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. The bride is inviting. The Holy Spirit's inviting. And who are they inviting? The guests. Not everybody is the bride. The spirit of prophecy, Sister White said, if you are the bride, you cannot be a guest. And if you are a guest, you are not the bride. But that's, that's the truth, isn't it? Guests are not the same thing as the bride. Now, the bride's responsibility is to invite the guests to the banquet. Now, we'll understand more when we get to heaven, exactly. But it's interesting to note that here in Denmark, when, when, when you get married, does the bride take the name of the husband or do you stay with your same name? You can choose. Okay. Um, normally you do. It's modern time. You can choose. Okay. But normally it's a normal custom for the bride to change her name, right? Okay. In, in North America it's the same way. You can choose, but that's the normal custom. Well, it happens, it happens that in the Bible the bride takes the name of the husband and it's written on her forehead. And you, we will read tomorrow, we will see tomorrow a little bit more about this special, the special characteristics of the bride. In Revelation, we will read in Revelation 3, we will read in Revelation 14 that the bride has to take the name of the husband because it shares the characteristics of the husband. Now, going back to the ten virgins, the ten virgins are waiting for Jesus' coming and suddenly there is an, a, a cry made, an, an event happens that wakes everybody up to the fact that the bridegroom is coming. There is no doubt. He is now on his way. This is what we've been waiting for. And they wake up, and some of them find they made no preparation. But they're all awake. They all want to go to the, bride, to the wedding party. All of them want to go. But only five of them made preparations through the Holy Spirit. Could I suggest to you that we are in that waiting time right now? Could I suggest to you that there is a preparation process that you need to go through with the Holy Spirit? Might I suggest to you that if you postpone it, you may not be able to get ready? 
A friend of mine had a, had a dream and she saw many people wailing and crying. And she asked, it was, it was like, a, like a, a special, like a vision, a, a special dream. And, and she asked the angel that was next to her, who are those people that are crying and that are wailing in agony? And the angel told her, those are the Seventh-day Adventists that thought they were ready, but they found out they were not. And now there's, the door is closed. They cannot enter. You don't want to be among that group. I don't want to be among that group. Would you like to be a church member and have grown up maybe second, third, and fourth generation knowing the truth, but you slept through the preparation time? And then when you wake up and everybody knows Jesus is coming, you find out you didn't make the preparation. And so you go to prepare. But when you come back, you knock on the door because that's what happened. It says, verse 11, Afterward came the virgins, the foolish virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I can't even imagine what it would be like for a believer, a church member, to have been a church member all our lives, have known the truth, only to realize that there is no hope. You cannot come in. Your preparation time is finished, but the door is now open to those that never heard before. That's why I came to Denmark. I came to share with you the most important work that we have to do right today. Today is a day for us to totally surrender to God and ask him to have total control of us. I didn't come to talk about the problems of the church. I didn't come to talk about the problems in the world tonight. I came to talk about our problem, our most urgent need. Our most urgent need is for the Holy Spirit to have total control of our lives and to prepare us spiritually and physically for the great events that are about to happen. Now, this could be September 10. It isn't. It's July. But what if tomorrow something happens? Could it happen tomorrow? Is it possible that tomorrow a great event could happen? Is it possible? Yes. Would it catch us by surprise? Yes, because we don't know when it's going to happen. Whenever it happens, it's going to be a surprise. I remember reading the history of Holland. When Hitler invaded Holland, they had four days before the surrender. In four days, Holland surrendered to Germany. Now, there were a lot of Jews in Holland. And those that did not leave before had to face the consequences. What were the consequences? Imprisonment and death, right? Imprisonment and death. But what, what if a Jewish family would have made a preparation what if a Jewish family would have left Holland on a boat the week before? And what if they were halfway across the Atlantic when the war started? Would they have sailed, or would they have arrived safely at their destination? Why? Because they made preparation. Even if it was one day before, if the ship would have left 24 hours before Hitler declared war on Holland, if they would have left Amsterdam and sailed for South America or North America, they would have continued their trip normally and they would have arrived. Only one day before, they would have been safe. But if they waited to leave until the day the war started, no ships left harbor. You see the importance of preparing before? We don't know when that date is going to be. All we know is it's preparation time today. And if we fail to prepare, if we fail to give ourselves totally to the control of the Holy Spirit, if we fail to allow God to have total control of us, and for whatever reason, dozens of reasons, we're too occupied, we're too busy, we can't do it now, this is not convenient, my family, what would they think? Whatever the reasons are you have. You want to stay in Holland until the, world, until the war begins? You can. 
but you die. If you surrender to God and ask him, Lord, I want to learn those lessons. Today, take full control of my life. Today, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Because if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God promises to cleanse it. It's his job. But we have to ask him to do that. And so if we do that today and we say, Lord, please, you know I love you. You know I want to be ready when you come. But there's still a lot in me of the world. There's still worldly desires and worldly habits and world. I love the world in many ways and I want to be completely prepared. I want to have oil in my lamp. I want the Holy Spirit to be fill me with the early rain so I can receive the latter rain. And then when that day comes and the door is closed, I want to be on the inside. I want you to be there too. Do you want to be there? That's the message for tonight and I hope it's been an encouragement to you. How many of us would like to tell the Holy Spirit by raising our hands, Lord, this is the experience I want to have. Amen. Would you be willing to kneel with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that we are here today in Denmark, in this beautiful location, a little small part of the earth that you have separated for us today. We understand that just waiting for your second coming does not guarantee us that we will be part of the wedding. We understand that there's a preparation process. It's very clear. We understand that we have to have oil in our lamps. And those that don't will not be able to acquire it. They will not be able to enter in and be inside when the door closes. Oh, Lord, we've raised our hand. We want to acknowledge that you want to come for your bride and that you want to prepare us and you want to have a bride that is ready without spot or wrinkle. But we still have spots and we still have wrinkles. So please forgive us our sins. Take full control of our lives, our homes, our churches. Take control of our families. Please take away from us anything that is of the world and replace it with things that are of God. Give us your white robe of righteousness. Only your life was a perfect life and our life is filled with failures and disobedience. Forgive us cleanse us and cover us with your white robe of righteousness lord this is what we ask for and give us a beautiful sabbath blessing this as the hours of sabbath have come on we just ask you to bless us with a special outpouring of the holy spirit may our homes our lives our minds be filled with your presence especially during the next 24 hours for this we thank you please bless light channel bless those that have driven from far off those that will see this program later those that are here as well in a special way we love you and we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.